and you're not very hungry. If you're not very hungry, you're probably living off your fat, right? So what is wrong with that? Well, fundamentally, there's nothing wrong with that. So about two years ago, I decided to try intermittent fasting in my own life, okay? Now, I'd eaten breakfast, I think, pretty much every day for about 20 years. And um, a patient of mine had lost about 100 pounds in weight, but she'd plateaued, and she said, what shall I do now? So we discussed intermittent fasting, and I said, I'll do it with you, okay? Now, she did something different. What I did was challenge the notion that I needed to eat breakfast. So what I started to do was delay my breakfast. So instead of having it at, I don't know, seven o'clock, I don't even remember when it was in those days, because it's a couple of years ago, but about seven o'clock, I just pushed it back and pushed it back. And within a week, I realized I was getting to lunch without being very hungry. And I was thinking, is this affecting my performance or my mood or anything like that? Is it diverting my attention for what I need to do in terms of my work or anything else? And I actually found, if anything, I was probably functioning even better without breakfast. So it made me think, well, is it okay for individuals to go for extended periods of time without eating? And then I started to see this in people that I work with in the corporate sector. So a lot of the people that I work with in the corporate sector, uh, you know, are lawyers, accountants. Um, they're usually very, very high functioning people. And every so often someone would come in and they would say something like, I'm a bit worried about my eating habits, okay, because they're a bit all over the place. Um, and my wife's worried about me because she thinks I should have breakfast and I never do. And you'd hear this very, very commonly. And then you ask them about their lives and how they function. No hunger. When they do eat, they eat very well. Hugely high functioning. No evidence, for example, in their biochemistry that there's anything going wrong. And it kind of convinced me that there is some legitimacy to this. And I'm not saying everyone needs to do it. But delaying your breakfast, skipping a breakfast, maybe having an early evening meal, and a later breakfast, for example, will, technically speaking, extend the time that insulin is low, and that overall is likely to be good for a number of things, including fat loss. The caveat here is that you cannot allow your hunger to get out of control. This is not an endurance exercise. This is not how long can I go before I buckle and eat a foot-long baguette for lunch. That is not the name of the game. You still need to be eating fundamentally healthy if you want to get the benefits of that. So the caveat here is if you want to try this, go for it. Just do not do it in a way that allows your appetite in any way to run out of control and make it harder for you to eat healthily. Now, with regard to um, exercise, um, I'm not a huge fan of endurance exercise. Now, I used to run a lot, okay, up until about um, 12, I think 12 years ago. I used to run 30 or 40 miles a week very often, was quite into my running, I would run you know, regular 10Ks, odd half marathons and things like that, okay? and I was really into it. Okay? But I've come to realise it is really not the best way for people generally to stay in good shape. In my case, my problem was it gave me a lot of running related injuries. Okay, so I had ankle problems, knee problems, hip problems, uh, a sacroiliac problem, that's a, a sort of, it's not really a joint, but it's a, where two bones meet in the pelvis, and uh, some back problems. And I was spending about as much time on the osteopath's couch than I was running, okay? And it convinced me that it was probably not the right thing. And then, obviously, I have been able to justify the fact that I don't run like that anymore uh, by looking at research that shows that it is, is, number one, not great for weight control, and number two, has anyone seen, there's recent evidence coming out that endurance exercise can cause scarring in the heart muscle? Anyway, there's, it's out there now, okay? So, could, in the heart muscle, yes, the cardiac muscle, yes, scarring, yeah. Because it's very hard, you know, running marathons and stuff like that is really hard work. If you have a, um, and by the way, I had all these running injuries, but even though I say so myself, I have a very easy running gait, and as you can see, I'm built for running, no doubt about that, and yet I was having lots of problems. I don't know whether I've scarred my heart muscle or not, but let me just tell you, in order to be fit and healthy, you don't need to do endurance exercise. If you want to do it, go for it, okay? But if you wanted to feel good, look good, okay, one thing that you might contemplate doing is some resistance exercise. So I'm sure, by the looks of you, there's a few of you that do that sort of stuff in here. Now, you can go to a gym and do that, but you don't necessarily need to. So both of my last two books contain very brief 12-minute exercise programs that you can do in the comfort of your own home with only some dumbbells, okay, or what's called a Dynaband. So it's essentially a, a giant elastic band. 
And if you just do that for 10 or 12 minutes a day, it's about the time it would take you to shave, okay, then there's a very good chance that you're going to be able to maintain your strength and your tone, okay, so that you look good if that's important to you. Now, there's another form of exercise that can actually promote fat loss, and it comes in the form of what is called high-intensity intermittent exercise, or what we used to call interval training, okay? So is anyone here engaged in any of this? Okay, very good, you're a great group, okay? So high-intensity intermittent exercise is what it says, okay? It's basically periods of very intense activity interspersed with periods of little or no activity. So for example, you might sprint for 10 seconds, and then jog or walk for 20 or 30 seconds, and then repeat that cycle five, six, maybe 10 times. You can do it on a rowing machine, you can do it on a bike. Spinning classes are very often based on this basic concept. And what's very interesting is this, is that the evidence shows that relatively short duration activity can have massive benefits in terms of improving things like fitness, and, and at least in some studies, fat loss, compared to steady state exercise, like just running at six and a half minute mile pace for 10 miles, okay? It can be massively beneficial. It is a very time efficient and effective way to be fit and strong, basically, particularly if you couple these two things together. So here's a little summary for you, okay? Here's some do's and don'ts of fat loss, okay? Uh, number one, um, first of all, do not uh, judge your weight by your body mass index or your weight. It doesn't tell you anything, okay? Uh, you're not old enough for me to say this, but basically, in front of other audiences, I would say, if you've got a bit of a gut, uh, you probably want to get rid of it. It's as simple as that. And everything else around this, in my view, is irrelevant, and I'd strongly advise you to ignore it. So I'd advise people not to consciously restrict calories, not to look at calories, count them, monitor them in any way, but just to eat food, which we're going to come on to in a moment, so I'll show you how to practically apply this. Don't eat a low-fat diet. Uh, a low-fat diet very often will not satisfy, and it also puts the emphasis where? On carbohydrates, which is a fundamental part of the problem, as, uh, as I see it. Please do not allow yourself to get very hungry. I can't tell you how important this is. I mentioned it earlier. I'm mentioning it again now. As I say, and this is very important, the less hungry you are overall, the easier this will be to do, the more weight you're likely to lose, and the more likely you are to sustain that weight loss. And we've just been talking about this. I, I generally encourage people not, unless they really want to, to engage in prolonged periods of aerobic exercise, okay? Yes, if you really love your triathlons and your marathon running, you could continue doing that if you want to, but do you need to do that to be fit and healthy and relatively low in terms of body fat? No, absolutely not. Here's a few do's. Um, Focus not on the quantity of the food that you eat and the calorific value, but the quality. So we're going to build on this in the next section. Um, I would generally encourage people to put more focus on protein and fat and a bit less on carbohydrate than is traditionally advised. Um, it's very important that when you approach meals that you're not famished, okay, because that makes it very difficult to eat healthily. So, for example, let's say you work and you come in from work, okay, and it's, I don't know, 7, 7.30, and you're starving hungry. It becomes very difficult to make controlled choices about what you're going to eat at that stage, right? When people are less hungry, they find it much easier to control what it is that, they've been, what, what it is that they eat. Now, generally, I advise people on a scale of 0 to 10, so 0 is no um, uh, hunger, 10 is I'll eat this stage, okay? You want to be about a 6 or a 7, okay? You might engage in some resistance exercise and maybe some high-intensity intermittent exercise, uh, you might contemplate intermittent fasting. Uh, you don't have to do that in an extreme way, but it's often very effective for accelerating fat loss or helping people through a plateau. And here's the other thing. See whatever changes that you make here as positive, enjoyable experiences. This is not a diet. This is not something to get on and get off. It's something to basically do where you just eat like this and keep eating like this. Now, does it matter if you have the occasional slip-up? No, of course it doesn't matter if you have the occasional slip-up because it's not slip-ups things that you do some of the time that determine what your long-term health and weight will be. It's what you do most of the time. And so when the focus is there and you're enjoying what you're eating and you're happy with that, if you have occasional treats, slip-ups, indiscretions or whatever, it really doesn't matter. And that's how, for example, you can eat healthily, get the benefits of that in the long term. As Anthony said, he thinks long-term when he's thinking about his exercise, not thinking about the benefits he'll get from that weekly session. 
He's thinking about the cumulative effect of those weekly sessions over 50 years, for example. You might think the same way. But does it matter if he misses a session one week? Of course it doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. I went out for dinner last night, okay? I didn't eat perfectly by any stretch of the imagination, and I drank, okay? Does it matter? No, because I just don't do it that often, so it can't matter. So the next thing that I want to talk about is this, because a lot of people say, you know, if you eat relatively carb a carb-restricted diet that's relatively rich in fat, then that's going to be bad for your health. Oh yeah, you may look good, but inside it's going to some, wreak some sort of havoc. So what I'm going to do now is quickly go through the impact of different foods on not our weight now, but our health, okay? So that we understand this is not just a way that you can optimize the way you look and feel, but also optimize your long-term health and reduce your risk of illness. And I'm going to start with this group of foods here called the carbohydrates. Now, carbohydrates are sugars and starches, okay? Now, why do we call these foods that look and taste quite different one thing? The reason is they are one thing. Starch is sugar. It's chains of glucose molecules. That's all it is, okay? So when you eat starch, you break it down into sugar. So whether you eat a sugar or a starch or both, the effect is the same. You'll get a rise in blood sugar. And in response to this, as we know, the body secretes a hormone called insulin. Now, this is all good, as long as we're keeping blood sugar levels stable. But if we falter here and have instability here, okay, then this can be really damaging to our long-term health. Now, first of all, in the short term, when we drop our blood sugar, what might happen? We need sugar generally for energy, okay? So if we drop our blood sugar, we can get what? Tired, yes. And when in the day are we most likely to get this, by the way? Yes, the afternoon. That 3.30, 4 o'clock lull is almost always caused by this fundamental problem. What else may happen? Your brain is only about 2% of your weight, but it uses about a quarter of the sugar in the bloodstream at rest. So if it doesn't get that sugar, guess what happens to your brain? It goes to sleep. So if you lose concentration, lose focus, all of a sudden around 3.30, 4 o'clock, this may well be an issue. Here's another thing. Low blood sugar can precipitate food cravings. Why? Because if blood sugar levels are low, then it's natural for your body to crave foods that replenish sugar quickly into your bloodstream. Like what? Cakes? Donuts? Biscuits? Sweets, yeah. Now, a lot of people think that when they succumb to this, they lack self-control and they've got a weak will. That might be true. They may be very inadequate people overall. I don't know. But usually when people are craving these foods and succumbing to them, it's because of physiological reasons, this fundamental imbalance, not psychological reasons. And here's another thing that can happen. This can wake you up in the night because when we drop our blood sugar level, it turns on the stress response. And that is not good for restful sleep. So we've got these problems there. Up here, though, if you make a lot of sugar, you're going to make a lot of insulin. And I've been telling you. You don't want a lot of insulin in the body, okay? So one of the things that we know is that high levels of insulin are associated with things like cardiovascular disease, like heart disease and stroke, an increased risk of diabetes, specifically type 2 diabetes over time. There's quite strong links between this range of issues and something called dementia. And of course, we covered this earlier. One of the things that may happen is that we're going to deposit fat. And when insulin is involved, very often that fat will be in or around the middle of the body, okay? just where we don't want it for a variety of reasons. So one of the things that you might think about in terms of having a diet that's going to work better for you, both in terms of your short and long-term health, is one that stabilizes blood sugar and moderates insulin. 